I'm headed to my perioperative appointment. You guys know I have surgery coming up at the end of this month on my thyroid. I'm gonna be having a left thyroidectomy and I'm here at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Super annoying because the parking situation down here, a mess. When I worked here last summer, I was so annoyed with the parking situation. That's one of the reasons why I did a contract here last summer. Six weeks in, I was like, no, nah, I'm not gonna be able to do this. The parking situation, I would have to park like three blocks away from the hospital. When you get in the hospital, you gotta walk like another five miles to get to your unit. I said, I'm not gonna be able to do this. That's why I don't like <laughs> large hospitals. I prefer smaller hospitals because nobody has time. Pre-op appointment is done, but let me tell you all the drama that just So the on. young lady, the medical assistant had to take, I don't know, something's my eyes itching me. The medical assistant had to, had to take my blood pressure. My blood pressure is reading. 186 over like 98 and i'm like clearly that's wrong she rechecks it in the other arm and it's like 178 over something so i said to her i'm like i think your cuff is faulty i said because my blood pressure is never that high like i don't have hypertension she rechecks it again blood pressure is reading 191 over like 102 should i go to the emergency the nurse practitioner comes in does her entire workup she rechecks my blood pressure with the same machine it's reading 178 over like 90s I'm like, I'm going to see my PCP. I called him up and he said, sure, come in at 4.30 this afternoon. So I will go to see my primary care doctor. We got our pastries. So now we're headed back home. Just pulled up in front of my primary care doctor's office and I'm freaking out to go inside because I'm like, what if my blood pressure really is that elevated? What if it's truly in the 180s to 190s systolically? My blood pressure was still elevated. 160s over like high 80s. I'm in shock. I'm actually in shock. I think I am over the initial shock of me and blood pressure gate. That's what I'm going to call it. Yesterday at my doctor's, he ended up giving me a prescription for amlodipine, which is a blood pressure medicine. He prescribed me a very low dose, five milligrams, and said that, you know, I should take it for a while and see what happens. I know that there are lifestyle changes I need to make, such as going back to the gym. I started last week and I need to continue this week. Even on the mornings when I have to go to work, I need to make sure and get up early, get to the gym and do at least 30 minutes of cardio, 15 minutes of free weights. I am also going to eliminate sodium completely from my diet. Like I never ate foods with high sodium content, but over the past year, I've been adding like salt to some of my foods and adding it to my scrambled eggs. Done. Because your girl cannot be on a blood pressure medicine. Like that is not what I have envisioned for my life. Being healthy and leading a very healthy life, not on medications, is one of the goals I have for myself. Courtney, I didn't even get to kiss you. Yesterday I purchased um, uh, automatic home blood pressure machine and I checked my blood pressure a few times last night and this morning the numbers are crazy I'm asking myself should I be taking care of the patients or should the patients be taking care of me yeah. I'm going to Walgreens and I'm going to fill that prescription that the doctor gave, gave me I told you guys I think I did amlodipine five milligrams I need to take that until I can get this thing under control I'm my prescription off and I'm gonna get ready to film some sit-down content I always do a little face. I have a hard time talking and doing my makeup, but the foundation that I just put on is the new Makeup by Mario. And this one's in the color 24N. Yeah, it's the Surreal Skin Foundation. So I like it. It's not too heavy. It's actually pretty light. 
gives a nice so I just glow. got done filming the sit down content that I probably will upload this weekend once I edit it. But y'all, I be fighting for my life for lighting in this house, okay? Fighting for my life. Here's my ring light, as you can see. And I'm standing right at the doorway. And I think that's where I get the best light. There's this like fancy lighting thingy. I'm thinking about ordering it. It's approximately $400, but you guys are worth it. You deserve good lighting. Good morning, happy Saturday. That was me getting ready, but I had to rush through it and I had to stop filming because I'm running behind. I'm taking my daughter to her piano recital, so I'll catch up with you all later. We came back from the rehearsal. We actually went and got something to eat before coming home, and then we've just been in the house lounging for the most part. It's like 30 degrees outside and it feels like 25, so we're not fans of the cold. Oh, by the way, guys, I started taking the blood pressure medicine. Uh, today will be day three on the medicine, and I've been checking my blood pressure. It's been in the 140s systolically, like the top numbers in the 140s, which is still high. So I'm hoping that I don't have to double up on the dose. I understand now why high blood pressure, also known as hypertension, is called the silent killer, because here I was walking around with my blood pressure elevated, and thankfully, I do go to the doctor. Thankfully, I have a relationship with my PCP. And thankfully, I was able to find out that, hey, your blood pressure is high. <laughs> Come get this medicine. Because working in the hospital and working in the ICU where I get so many neuro patients suffering from stroke, a lot of them did not know that their blood pressure was sky high. Like I've seen patients come into the hospital with blood pressures literally in the 240s over 120s, walking around like that. A whole stroke walking around. And it's not until they pass out or the family member says, I heard a fall and when I went upstairs, she was on the floor. They called 911, come in, blood pressure sky high. So I guess the one takeaway I want for people to get from this vlog is that it's very important to keep up with your primary care doctor. Very important to know your status, like as far as blood pressure and everything goes. I mean, for me, this was pretty sudden. My blood pressure has always been in the 120s systolically, but something changed. Good morning. It's Sunday, it is 8.30 a.m. and I am off to a late start. I'm an early bird. I like to start my Sundays at 7 a.m. The gym opens at 7 a.m., but whatever. I am about to get up, get dressed, and head to the gym. The way how outside is cold, y'all. It's like 27 degrees and it feels like 20. Running into the gym. All right, y'all, time for nurse talk. We need to have a little chat about the nurses who are still tattletailing. This has to stop. We cannot be a profession working, taking care of sick people, and uh, acting like high schoolers or better yet acting like kindergartners tattletailing if a problem arises or if you notice a discrepancy in care or something with the plan of care the medications or whatever so long as it's not a significant issue one that can possibly cause the patients their life have a conversation with your colleague if you come in, for example, this is a situation that recently happened to my friend. She was taking care of a patient. The patient was intubated, sedated, and the patient started waking up, acting really wild, and she went up on his propofol. Now, a lot of you might be familiar with propofol because of Michael Jackson. That's the drug that Michael Jackson was sleeping on. That's how he was getting his night's rest on propofol. Propofol is a drug that's used in the ICU setting. It's also used in surgery. Anesthesia has way more an autonomy over the use of propofol than ICU nurses. We're not supposed to push propofol. We can hang it as a drip and we use it to keep the patient sedated, especially if they're on, well, not especially, only when they're on a ventilator, propofol should be used. And remember, Michael wasn't on a ventilator, but this is not about Michael. Propofol is a drug that's titratable, meaning that as a nurse working in the ICU setting, we can go up and down on the propofol 
dependent on the patient's neurological status and behavioral status. So if the patient is too awake, biting the tube, not synchronized with the vent, we can go ahead and increase the propofol. If the patient is too sedated, meaning that it's difficult to elicit a response and I have to use painful stimuli and that, that is not eliciting a response, the patient might be too sedated. So now as the ICU nurse, I have the autonomy to determine or to decide whether to come down on that propofol. So we can go up, we can go down. And there's other drugs also in the ICU that we have permission or that we're able to titrate as nurses working in that setting. My friend was taking care of a patient, like I said, intubated on a ventilator who was not adequately sedated, meaning that he was waking up, he was trying to pull for the tube, just thrashing in the bed. So in this specific hospital where she's at, the propofol, the nurses there are not allowed to titrate it, which is crazy to me because I'm like, this is the ICU. Why is it an ICU then if we can't titrate the propofol? Anyway, the patient was acting up. So in that moment, my friend went up on the propofol. The propofol was ordered by the provider to run at 30 mics an hour. The patient was acting up. My patient bumped it. My friend bumped it to 40, rightfully so. That's what any prudent ICU nurse would do along with, you know, whatever other sedation is on. We would go up on it to subdue the patient because overall the main goal is to prevent the patient from extubating, like pulling the tube out or pulling some of the important invasive lines in like the central line, the A line, the Foley catheter anything so we just need that patient to be really calm and relaxed and sedate she went up on the propofol and she communicated with the provider that hey he was in there thrashing around restless agitated so i went up from 30 to 40. provider was like okay cool yeah it's appropriate i'll go ahead and i'll change the order which the provider forgot to put in the change of order so as a nurse and especially a new grad or a nursing student always double check your orders and always Whenever the provider says that they're going to do something, it's your job to double check behind them. You have to double check. Don't take anyone's word for anything. So the provider forgot and, you know, change of shift came. My friend is given report to the night shift nurse who's going to assume care of the patient. And she gives the whole rundown of what's been going on. And uh, she also told the nurse that, hey, the propofol is running at 40. The night shift nurse discovers that the drug the propofol was not supposed to be titrated, even though my friend did titrate. The night shift nurse is like, oh, well, it's not titratable. So my friend is like, well, yeah, just get the night shift provider to change it because day shift provider said it was a go. He must have forgot. Just have your night shift provider change it. Instead of having that conversation with the night shift provider, the nurse decides to send a message to the manager reporting my friend stating that the drip was not titratable. It was ordered to run at 30 mics per hour and my friend was running the F40. Didn't provide any contacts. And it's like, girl, why are you like this? Why are so many nurses like this? There's this phenomenon in nursing that always seems to amaze me where everybody wants to be right. Everybody wants to be the smart one. Everybody wants to be the one who discovered the problem and found a solution while throwing their colleagues under the bus. Like, it's crazy. And a lot of you, I know I'm going to get some comments that a lot of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Rather than, this is what I would have done in that situation if that was me, if I was a night shift nurse. If I knew that the drug was not titratable, but I also understand that a situation happened to where my colleague, the day shift nurse, had to go up under propofol all in the name of patient safety. Now that I'm assuming care of the patient, I would go back down on the propofol. I would just turn it back down to 30. Now that the patient is calm, you know, now that he's not thrashing in the bed, he's not restless, agitated, I would just come down on the propofol. I didn't need to go say anything to anybody. I wouldn't, it would just be like, okay, girl, I get it. You did what you had to do. You forgot to come back down on it or you left him on the 40 to keep him calm. I'm gonna just come back down and follow the order. Why are you, there was no need to report that to the manager. And this is the thing, what a lot of nurses need to realize is that you're giving yourself a bad name. You're giving yourself a bad name because rather than having that conversation or rather than just saying, okay, I took, I assume care. It's, I'm going to run this shift how I want to run it. I'm going to come back down on the propofol, on the rate. You run now and you go tell the manager. And what does the manager do? The manager just tells my friend, hey, I got a report that you were running the propofol 
at a different rate than what was ordered. Just keep in mind that we don't tie trade or you would need to have had the order changed. And my friend was like, yeah, the provider forgot to change it, but he did verbally say that it's okay to run it at 40. I can always get him to change it. And the manager was like, okay, cool. So now you, the tattletale, just created a whole entire situation to where you've now created discourse between you and one of your colleagues. For what reason? When that was a simple conversation, that was an easy fix. There was no harm done to the patient. It's not as though propofol is not a titratable drug. It's very well much so a titratable drug. It's just that that institution does not allow you guys to titrate it, which leads me to question, why is there even an ICU here? Like, come on. And especially as a nurse, and like my friend, she's also a nurse who has worked in multiple different settings, like multiple ICUs where, yeah, we go up, we go down, we go up, we go down. So you're in the habit of going up and going down. You, like no one would think if you're doing something for the benefit of the patient and there's no harm, no, the patient didn't incur any harm, there was no negative outcome, why are you reporting? I just wanted to have this conversation with you all. Like not everything needs to be reported. Some things just need to be a conversation. And with saying that, let me just also point out that other disciplines do not treat each other that way. The way nurses treat each other, terrible. I have friends who were physicians and it's a conversation I've had with them. Let's just say, for example, a physician orders a CAT scan of the abdomen for their patient. The radiologist gets the report, reads it, and forgets to mention a cyst that he saw growing on the gallbladder or the liver. There's a cyst, there's a prominent cyst. The primary care doctor is not gonna go report the radiologist to the medical supervisor, to the chief medical officer. He's not gonna go around and say to the family, well, you know, I saw the report and there was a cyst that the radiologist missed, but I found it. No, the physician is gonna call the radiologist and say, hey, I noticed that you didn't mention a cyst on the gallbladder. Did you miss it? Because it's there. Can you just update it and add an addendum to it? Simple fix. Communication. That's what professionals do. Leave me your thoughts on this issue in the um, comments.